You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 351 of the podcast. And in this one, I chat with Dr. Robert Hudak. Robert is a psychiatrist and associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, I got him on to talk in particular about schizophrenia and OCD, or OCD and schizophrenia, so having those two diagnoses together. This isn't an episode on when you have an OCD theme of worrying about having schizophrenia. Um, I have done an episode on that in the past with Dr. John Grayson, and I'll put the link to that in the show notes. Um, so this is an episode specifically on having those two diagnoses of schizophrenia and OCD. So in this episode, we talk about his therapy story. He defines the terms psychosis and schizophrenia, including breaking down terms like hallucinations and delusions. We talk about the prevalence of having the two diagnoses, how to differentiate obsessions from delusions. We discuss using exposure response prevention therapy for OCD if you also have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and how to factor that in uh, to make sure ERP is still going to be effective for OCD. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or the link will be in the episode description. So thank you to Robert for his time. It was really insightful. I'm, I'm grateful to finally cover this topic of these two diagnoses coexisting. Uh, thank you as always to you guys for listening. I deeply appreciate it. And without further ado, here's Dr. Robert Hudak. Welcome to the show, Bob. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you on. Uh, so um, it'd be great to hear your kind of therapy journey, you know, what got you into being a psychiatrist and then in particular OCD and schizophrenia? Well, you know, that that is, um, it, it's a bit of a long story. I, I, I'll try to shorten it. I always loved science and I, and, and I love medicine. Mm. And when I was in medical school, I, I realized that I, I didn't enjoy the, the rotations I was doing, internal medicine, surgery. I mean, I was enjoying them, but I, I couldn't see myself doing them. And I kind of fell into psychiatry by accident. It was, I, I said I could do this internship in, you know, in psychiatry and, and figure out what I wanted to do then with my life. And I wasn't even sure I was going to be a doctor. And four months into my, into my internship, um, I was working with family practice and we were doing a rotation on the psychiatric unit, um, not a rotation, excuse me, a consultation on the psychiatric unit. And there was a patient who, in, um, who was manic and banging on the door, yelling over and over again. There was a patient running up and down the hall screaming. And there was another patient in the music room banging on the piano saying um, alligator rock. I think they were trying to do the Elton John crocodile rock, but was saying alligator rock over and over again. The, the 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 family practice doctors I was with were just freaking out and saying, we need to get off of here as soon as possible. And I said to myself, well, wait a second, this is where I'm comfortable. This is like home for me. And so I, I realized that's really when psychiatry fit for me. OCD, I kind of fell into. Um, I, I happen to have a lot of OCD patients as a resident. And then later on, as a young attending, I got a lot of consults for OCD patients. And um, unlike the other illnesses, I there there was no place for me to refer them to. And I said, I, there there isn't this OCD specialist for me to refer them to. And I said, well, I'll keep them and, and I'll be the OCD guy. And it, it just kind of stuck. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing. Um, so it'd be good. Um, you know, most of my listeners have, have probably listened for a while, uh, very familiar with OCD and a lot of the nuances of it. Um, schizophrenia is not really something I've covered at all. Um, so I think initially it'd be good to define some terms. So I guess what, what is schizophrenia? Uh, what is psychosis and how do they differ? Okay. 
Um, well, uh, first off, let me let me define psychosis. So psychosis is technically defined as a break from reality. And when we talk about psychosis, there are three things that make up psychosis. You don't have to have all three to be psychotic, but usually one of the three will do it. One of them is an hallucination. So having hallucinations. So basically hallucination is just, if most people know what hallucination is, it's a false sensory perception. So in other words, you hear something that isn't there, you see something that isn't there, you taste something that isn't there, you see something that isn't there. These are hallucinations. Um, so any one of your five senses can 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 have a false perception, that's an hallucination. And then the second part of the psychosis is a delusion. And the delusion is just, it, the simplest way to describe it is a false fixed belief. So the person has a belief that just is verifiably not true. Um, so for example, someone may believe that they are um, um, reincarnated um, Jesus. Or they may believe that there is um, um, a government conspiracy out to get them and to kill them when such a clear thing is clearly not happening. Um, sometimes um, delusions can get pretty bizarre. Patients will say that they have a microchip implanted in their brain by space aliens. It's controlling their thoughts. Mm. So those are delusions. And then the third thing that makes up psychosis would be what's called a thought disorder. A thought disorder is a little harder to explain, but to think of it as your thoughts just don't work correctly. Um, so when you try to come up with a sentence, when you try to come up with, with uh, um, a, a way to organize words and you want to say something, there's a certain way your thoughts get organized in your head, come out of speech. People with a thought disorder that that process of their or of, of your orderly thoughts just just it gets disrupted and there's lots of different ways it can get disrupted i do want to point out that people with ocd can have certain issues with their thoughts as well their thoughts can be sticky repetitive they can repeat over and over again that can look like what a thought disorder that is not considered a thought disorder however um, so I just want to be I, I so again, I want to make perfectly clear that, that the issues that people have with their thoughts not working correctly with OCD is not a thought disorder. And the types of thought disruptions that someone with psychosis has. Is very different. It's a different type of disruption. Um, and, you know, I could go over the different types of thought disruptions that people have, but just suffice it to say that, 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 that they're, when you're talking with someone with schizophrenia, it can be very hard to follow what they're saying because what they say doesn't make logical sense hmm. sometimes. Okay. All right. So that, those are the three elements of psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, and, and thought disruption. Schizophrenia is a form of psychosis and it's a it's a formal um psychiatric disorder and one of the more common causes of psychotic disorders so note that there are other types of psychosis that people can get schizophrenia is one of them there are others so you can say that all people with schizophrenia have psychosis but not all people with psychosis have schizophrenia um if if I can just formally um, um, define schizophrenia a little bit, I think the first thing I can say is because you do say you have an audience that that of of um, uh, OCD sufferers who aren't um, clinicians or mental health professionals. Uh, a lot of people um, think the term schizophrenia means split personality. That has to do with a, a mistranslation of the word. Basically, schizophrenia has nothing to do with split personalities or multiple personalities. Nothing whatsoever at all. Schizophrenia is, you know, it's considered a, a again, people who have a break with reality. And this is because they have the psychotic disorder. And they also have usually have other related symptoms. Um, that also make it very difficult and make it such a, one of the most severe and disabling psychiatric disorders around. Um, so, for example, someone with schizophrenia will have something called 
negative symptoms. And with the negative symptoms, these are symptoms where the person wants to isolate. They don't feel the need to be social or around other people. Um, and that that can accompany the psychosis that someone with schizophrenia has. So I hope I hope that kind of clears up your, your your question here a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's interesting what you said about um, schizophrenia not being a split personality uh, sort of disorder. And um, that, yeah, I've been aware of that for a while. And it makes me think of with OCD, it's so misunderstood in the media and in TV. And so is schizophrenia, because it's very much portrayed as that split Absolutely. I just read in in the, the newspaper yesterday, someone had made a comment about, you know, the weather being schizophrenic because it can be either one or the other. And, you know, that that is very similar saying saying something is is schizophrenic by meaning that, that it can have different personalities or, or two different phases like that is, is, is just the same as saying I'm so OCD because I like to have things neat and clean. Yeah, it, it, it's exactly the same thing. Um exactly analogous and yes you'll never catch me doing that okay good <laughs> uh, um and i maybe just to briefly touch on what are some of the other psychotic disorders um there, there are other psychotic disorders that can occur there is um a, a something called a delusional disorder where someone can have um uh, just simply delusions without the other types of psychosis. Um, so without hallucinations, they, they don't have the thought disorder and they generally don't have the negative symptoms that people get with schizophrenia either. And by negative symptoms, again, I'm talking about the withdrawal, the social isolation and, 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 um, and basically very blunted personality. You see someone with no expression on their face is, is a negative symptom. People who have delusional disorder have just delusions and nothing else. Um, there are a lot of medical conditions that can cause psychotic disorders as well. Um, things like uh, a, a delirium um, can cause psychosis. So delirium is just a temporary confusion that people get, usually due to any any type of medical illness. Um, and, and there's all different kinds of names for delirium out there. And again, delirium can be caused by anything. Um, people with um, dementia, um, the various types of dementia, Alzheimer's, um, dementia due to strokes, they can sometimes develop psych psychosis as well. Um, secondary to drug addictions, people um, or secondary to, to drug use, um, people can become psychotic, especially things like uh, cocaine and some stimulants can cause people to be, you know, become psychotic. Withdrawal from alcohol can cause people to become psychotic. So again, there, there's a whole wide range of things that can cause psychosis. There are some are psychiatric, some are, again, more medically based. But again, psychosis is just a very broad kind of general term. Right. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I guess if we focus more on schizophrenia, because that has psychosis kind of embedded in it, and then we cover some of that other stuff indirectly. But yeah, in terms of comorbidity with OCD, um, what do you know? Is there any evidence or stats or data on that of who has OCD and schizophrenia? <laughs> yes, there is. Although um, you're going to get a, a, a wide variety of, of, of answer on that. Um, because they're, they're, it depends on, on who you read um, and, and who does the study. So there is no doubt that people with schizophrenia have a higher rate of OCD than exists in the general population. How much higher that is, is up for debate. Um, you, you will read it's anywhere between 10 and 50 percent of people with schizophrenia also have obsessive compulsive disorder, or at least they have obsessive compulsive like symptoms. Um, so 10 to 50 percent is a real wide range. So what that means is we know OCD is increased in people with schizophrenia, um, but we don't know exactly how much yet. Okay. I think more studies, bigger studies would be helpful in, in pinning that down. We just we don't have a good answer on that yet for an exact number. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think I read on one of your articles, maybe the ISDF one, um, if the OCD or the, the obsessive compulsive symptoms occur only when someone is having, say, a psychotic episode, then it can't be classified or diagnosed as OCD. Am I 
Yeah, that is correct. And so that's interesting. The very first patient, I, psychiatric patient I ever saw as a medical student was a woman with schizophrenia. And she was recovering and ready to be discharged from the hospital when I saw her. She had um, she heard voices of the devil telling her to wash her hands repeatedly. So she would wash her hands all day long and have, you know, the, and, and have the usual issues with with skin that, that you know, skin issues, dermatological issues that, that you would expect with that. But when she was treated with the medication we used back then, haloperidol on her, um, her voices went away. She stopped hand washing. So we do not call a person like that as having OCD because they don't the, the hand washing was not a compulsion. It wasn't from an obsession. It was a voice telling her to do this. This this was coming directly from the schizophrenia, directly from the hallucination. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that example. That's that's yeah, really interesting. Um, so I guess um, the the thing that prompted me to want to do this episode, although I've wanted to do it for a while, I just needed something to sort of push me over the edge to do it. Was um, I was speaking to someone who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia i believe and ocd and they were asking me the question you know how do i differentiate between when it's my obsession and when it's ocd and when it's a, a delusion um so i just i'll put that question out there to you how do you tell the difference yeah th that that is th that's a tough one mm. um and, and i have a number of different answers to that um so the, the one thing i might say with that is that Whenever someone comes to me with the diagnosis of OCD and schizophrenia, I do want to confirm that they actually have a diagnosis of schizophrenia because it's easy to um, for, for mental health professionals to incorrectly diagnose schizophrenia in people with OCD, especially someone who's not an OCD specialist, because most mental health professionals aren't trained in OCD. So they think of OCD as the fear of germs and the checking the stove disease. Mm -hmm. And if someone has OCD symptoms outside of that, they can inappropriately diagnose schizophrenia. Okay. So let me put that aside for a, a, a minute here and, and more directly answer the question. So if someone really does have schizophrenia and OCD, it can be hard. And I see patients with schizophrenia and OCD who are pretty able to tell the difference between their obsessions and the other stuff going on. They kind of know what's OCD and then the other stuff. Whether they one of the, the traits with schizophrenia is people with schizophrenia often don't have good insight mm. into what's into that they have a disease actually. So in, in a sense, schizophrenia is almost the exact opposite of OCD. People with OCD have usually pretty good insight that, that these symptoms are not me. These symptoms are, are something else. These symptoms are a disease. Now, not everybody with OCD has that, but kind of classically, that's kind of how you think of it with people with OCD with good insight. Schizophrenia is almost the exact opposite. People have very poor insight into the fact that they have a disease. They don't recognize that they have an illness. Um, so you can get it kind of both ways with someone with schizophrenia. You can say, I know these are OCD symptoms and I'm going to work on them. And they may or may not recognize that they have schizophrenia. Conversely, it can happen the other way where someone with schizophrenia, it just, they do have a hard time of recognizing the difference between their OCD symptoms and their schizophrenia symptoms. One thing that can make it worse is the symptoms can, can, can mix and meld. So the symptoms, when they're psychotic, the symptom can be delusional. And as their psychosis is treated, the symptom can kind of develop or, or, or kind of morph into an obsession. And one of the classic uh, examples that was given of that, it was written in a paper um, back in the 90s, was a patient who believed they were the devil um, when they were psychotic. And when their psychosis was treated, they had obsessions about worried about being the devil and would check themselves to make sure that they didn't have devil horns. So it can be tough for those people to know if they have obsessions versus delusions. And it can be tough for them to tell which is which. Certainly anyone who is asking the question, I think is already a couple of steps ahead of the game. And there is, 
you know, you would do education and cognitive therapy on these people just to help them distinguish between, you know, which symptoms are which. But anyone who's asking the question, I'm pleased to hear because, again, they're 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 well ahead of the game here. Yeah, it shows a level of insight, right? Exactly, exactly, and and that insight is important um, when you want to when you want to get better. And again, you don't have to. You know, again, the insight doesn't have to be perfect, but just knowing, hey, I want to try to figure this out. I'm, I'm I'm always happy to hear that. I'm always pleased to hear that. I I that's my clue that someone's going to do okay in therapy yeah. in treatment. Okay, good, good. Um, and what about um? We always talk obviously with OCD. The the obsessions being ego dystonic. Um, does that come into play here with, with delusions? Are they more syntonic or not? So is it not clear cut? Yes. Um, th there are, there is a big difference between obsessions and delusions being ego syntonic and ego dystonic. Um, I think the, the problem Stu is that it can be very difficult to tell the difference between ego dystonic and ego syntonic. And it's even difficult for mental health professionals. Mm. Part of the reason for this is that as, as, as human beings, um, we're not necessarily, um, we're not necessarily programmed to think about what it's like to have a thought. We always focus more on what the thought is. Ego syntonic or dystonic is focused on what they mean is is on what a thought feels like. So so let me explain that. So an ego dystonic is that I have a thought and it doesn't feel natural to have this thought. Ego syntonic, a thought feels perfectly normal and natural. You don't question the fact that you have this thought. And again, this sounds easy, but most of the time we focus on what a thought is and not what a thought is like. And I, I, I kind of have a, a, a sim simplistic example. Um, this is more of, of a U.S. example. I apologize. But um, if you ask someone what it's like to be a fan of the Los Angeles Lakers, that's a U.S. basketball yeah. team. Um, you, I guess if you want to use a, a U.K. example, maybe you can say Manchester United or something. But mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stick with the Lakers. I'm a little more familiar with uh, basketball. You ask someone what it's like to be a fan. How do you, how does it feel to be a fan? They're going to say, I love being a fan of the Lakers because they win so many championships. Mm. See, so right away, you ask them, how does it feel to have this thought about being a fan? They pivot to content. You know, they pivot to content. It's great because they win so many championships. So what they've done is they, they, they've said nothing about what it's like to have this thought. And this is kind of a simple example, but th this this ha this is a big problem here when you're trying to distinguish between ego dystonic and ego syntonic, because um, psychiatrists um, who aren't trained in OCD will often try to look at what the thought is to determine whether it's ego syntonic or ego dystonic, rather than what the thought feels like. So as I mentioned before. Psychiatrists um, often think of OCD as it's a fear of germs or, you know, I need to check the stove. I'm worried I left the stove on disorder. It's OCD is not the fear of germs disorder. And it's not that I'm worried I left the stove on disorder. Obsessions can literally be about anything. Um, psychiatrists, then when they see someone with schizophrenia and someone with schizophrenia may complain, for example, they're being monitored by cameras. And so when a psychiatrist hears, I, I'm worried I'm being monitored by cameras, they automatically think psychosis. But again, the problem is that's focusing on content. That's not focusing on ego dystonic or ego syntonic. Um, and it really is a matter of, is it comfortable to have this thought and not what the thought is? When I lecture, I do I, I, I give um, um, an example. When I lecture to people who don't have OCD, a lot of your audience has OCD, so they're going to understand this right away. But when you uh, when people are doing the dishes, they run the garbage disposal. There is a there is a, a brief 
thought that a lot of people get. Certainly when I do lectures, I have people do a show of hands and usually about three quarters of the room will raise their hands. So look at the thought, what would happen if I put my hand in the garbage disposal? Well, it's running. And the person, you know, they usually laugh that off and go on. That's an example of, of a, like a, an intrusive thought, but it's a subclinical intrusive thought. The person knows it's silly. The person doesn't want to put their hand in the garbage disposal while it's running and they don't do it. And they laugh it off. The only difference with that and OCD is, of course, of course, the person with OCD, that thought, a thought like that doesn't go away. It'll stay there in in in, in that very time that, that that they're anxious and and it can really develop in, into a severe anxiety. So that's that's the intrusive thought. Again, it doesn't matter what the intrusive thought is. I've had many people who've had intrusive thoughts of I'm worried about being spied upon with cameras. I'm worried that the FBI is monitoring me. I had one patient who stated he was worried that space aliens were were monitoring him. He had obsessions about this. Again, they weren't delusions, but it's very easy for psychiatrists to say it's delusional because of the content. So another example I can give that to you is you may have the thought if you're on a diet, you're trying to lose weight. You may have the thought of I would like some chocolate cake. You may consider that to be an unwanted thought, but it really isn't. You'd like chocolate cake and you really would want some chocolate cake. You just don't want it because you're dieting. So it's easy to confuse that thought and say, well, that's an unwanted intrusive thought, but it isn't. It, 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 it's a wanted thought. Ego syntonic thoughts are like that. You know, we, we can we can be upset about what the thought is, but the thought itself feels perfectly natural. I have the ego syntonic thought that I'm a U.S. psychiatrist. I live in the United States. I'm a psychiatrist, too. And I'm to me, this is a perfectly natural, normal thought. The thought feels real. And I'm convinced I'm a U.S. psychiatrist. I might be wrong, but I, I it feels right to me. I know I, I, I know I am. And I don't care what anyone else says about it. That's that's what an ego syntonic thought is. So, again, it doesn't matter what the thought is about. It's how the thought feels to have. It doesn't feel normal to have a thought. I want to put my hand in the garbage disposal. It feels normal for me to have a thought. I'm a psychiatrist. And that's a difference between the ego dystonic and the ego syntonic thought. Yeah, yeah. And of course, OCD typically being categorized of I don't want these thoughts. They're horrible. They're against what I want or, you know, um, it's that feeling there of this is disgusting. I don't want it. Whereas, yeah, they in no way are most people with OCD okay with the thoughts, right? They 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 want to get rid of them, hence the compulsions. Yeah. yeah. And again, it can be confusing and you really have to, to know about mm. this. Um I sometimes addictive um specialists will say, well, aren't you know, aren't addictions obsession too? Because the patients will get thoughts about wanting to use drugs and they don't they don't want to use drugs. They don't want these thoughts. Well, no, that, but that's not, that's not an ego dystonic thought. It's not an intrusive thought. They, they don't want to use drugs. They don't like the thought, I want to use drugs. But the thought of, I want to use drugs, the presence of that thought is normal. What they don't like is the content, I want to use drugs. That's what they don't like. But the thought itself, I want to use drugs, that's perfectly normal. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, and I like what you said about, um, yeah, the I can't remember. It was it the spaceship one, and and for that person, it was it was an obsession, not a, a delusion. Yeah. But to anyone else, you'd think that's that's got to be a delusion, right? That can't be. But it's yeah, they were worrying about being invaded or taken over on it. They weren't. Yeah. Yeah. See. So, yeah. See. So the the problem is, is that when you say that that I have this weird intrusive thought that I'm being monitored, you know, by aliens, it sounds bizarre and it sounds crazy. Mm -hmm. And so, as a result, you know, the term sounds crazy. Mental health professionals will often go to psychosis at that point. Yeah. But I would argue that by definition, every obsession sounds crazy to the person who has it. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, I have a fear of germs, you know, I, I'm afraid of, of touching the doorknob and I have to wash my hands for 30 minutes afterwards. So the person who has that at some point, the person will say, I know this is crazy, but I can't help it. Yeah. So who cares whether it's a it's a fear of germs that sounds crazy or or a fear of, of being monitored by space aliens that sound crazy. It's it's all an obsession. And I have numerous obsessions that patients have had like that. Um, 
I can tell you about. For example, I had one patient who was afraid to touch his computer because he was afraid he would get a be infected with a computer virus. Knows how silly that is, but couldn't do it. Um, I had a patient very early on in my career who was definitely afraid to drive by cemeteries because he was afraid that if he saw a cemetery, he would feel the urge to dig up a dead body, wrap it around himself like a cape and walk around with it. Knew this was crazy. Wonder why would I think such a crazy thought? Okay. Again, it was very easy to call, to call these people psychotic because the thoughts sounded so crazy. But again, they're intrusive thoughts, they're obsessions. It's ego dystonic. It's OCD. It doesn't matter what the thought is. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, okay. So um, obviously the ERP, exposure and response prevention therapy, is, is seen as the gold standard for OCD. And obviously there are some more therapies coming in now, like uh, acceptance commitment therapy alongside, et cetera. But um, with uh, schizophrenia, what is the... The, the recommended therapy, so to speak, based on research? Yeah, the recommended therapy is still going to be ERP. Mm. Um, there hasn't been a, a, a ton of research um, on OCD therapy in people with schizophrenia. You know, we recently wrote a review paper, and essentially what I had to do was um, make up all the recommendations for therapy myself um, based on, you know, consulting with some colleagues who, 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 who I cited in the paper, because there literally is nothing written about it. No one has ever really studied this. But the bottom line is the same. You're going to use ERP. You may have to modify the ERP. You may have to do it a little bit differently um, in people with schizophrenia than you will um, in someone with pure OCD. But as far as the, you know, as far as what's the treatment, it's still going to be ERP. I, I have a statement, Stu, and I'll say this here, um, and hopefully everyone listening will take this to heart. ERP works. Mm. You know, if you do ERP for OCD, you're going to get better. It works. It really does. Um, and if I could say anything hopeful here, it's going to be that. Every study that's ever been done shows that ERP works. There, there was a great study we had presented to us some years ago. Um, that showed that if you have ERP from a, a tenured professor versus ERP from uh, a rotating intern, um, ro rotating through the OCD, doesn't matter. Patients get equally better. It doesn't matter who you get it from. If you have good ERP, you get better. Mm, yeah. And it's going to be the same with schizophrenia. If doing ERP, they're going to get better. And you may have to modify it, but... That's st it's, it's still the gold standard. Still what you yeah. got to do. Yeah, thank you for that. And just to clarify, you're referring to, in this case, ERP uh, just on the OCD with someone with uh, schizophrenia. The ERP is not being used towards the schizophrenic symptoms in any way. Yeah, th yeah. Th th thank you for clarifying that. Yes, exactly. I I'm talking about just the OCD. There are there are some therapies that are used in in schizophrenia to help mm -hmm. people um, to help people with their 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 schizophrenia symptoms, their their psychotic symptoms, um, as well as their their negative symptoms. Um, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking purely just focusing on the OCD symptoms. You can use the ERP. Okay, great. Thank you. And how would are there any ideas you want to share around, I guess, tailoring ERP if you need to for someone with a comorbidity of schizophrenia? Yeah. So um, I, I can talk uh, about this and, and basically just kind of take take the ideas from my paper. And, and probably the biggest challenge with people with schizophrenia is just simply getting them to agree to do um, getting them to agree to do um, the ERP in the first place. You know, you know, they. Because people with schizophrenia have generally poor insight, if they don't have the good insight into their OCD symptoms as well, it can be tough. Um, but if you can, again, there's still little data on this, but even people with poor insight, I do believe, can improve with ERP. Um, and, and there is some meager, there have been some very meager studies that, 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 that back that up. Um, what's nice now is that there is a scale that's been in use for some years now called the Brown's Assessment of Belief Scale that measures insight. And I think is that there have been a number of studies that's done with ERP with that. And I think that as that scale becomes used more and more, I think there's going to be more data on 
this that you know we can give you more helpful information but anyway i think you still use erp i think that some of the things you do with people with schizophrenia is that you um you tend to be um um they need extra time so you give them extra time one of the things that i like to do with people with schizophrenia is i get them into an intensive outpatient setting so where you have a three hour a day um, opportunity to do ERP rather than one hour a week in the office. Um, one hour a week in the office may not be enough with someone with schizophrenia, especially to start out with. Um, you tend to um, you, you tend to um, be a little more concrete in your instructions, and you have to be kind of more exact. So someone with schizophrenia, it, you, you can't be abstract. You have to explain things very concretely and um, really kind of help walk them through the process. And that's something where the, the, the greater amount of time, um, that flexibility from the clinician can help as well. And there are some, there are some uh, uh, personal um, things that you do as well. Um, you try to maintain a professional demeanor. I might not be as casual and jovial um, with someone with schizophrenia as I will with just a straight OCD person. And that's just simply because people with schizophrenia can have some suspiciousness and paranoia, and they may not respond, you know, overtly to to friendliness, and and they they can actually be turned off by that. So sometimes they prefer more of a professional kind of a white coat type demeanor. So you may have to change, you know, personally change your demeanor a little bit, and um, you may spend a lot of time refocusing as well. So and again, that's where the longer the longer episodes have and some with schizophrenia again they they may get off into tangents and you may have to bring them back to the ocd and bring them back to the erp and so that those are probably the main modifications i would make to erp in in someone with um schizophrenia yeah brilliant thank you for those i appreciate it so uh, I've got a couple other questions now, but they're not necessarily linked to the topic of this episode. So is there anything else you want to say on this topic before we move on? Um, I, I think I've said most of, of, of the main topic. I, I guess if I have to, to, to re reiterate one thing is, is that um, there are a lot of people out there who get misdiagnosed with, with schizophrenia mm. when they actually have OCD. And so I, I, I just, um, I, I just encourage, you know, patients and family members, if, if they're, if they're not sure about such a diagnosis, you know, try to see someone who's an OCD specialist. And I think that, um, you're, you're much likely to get a better opinion or, or conversely, you can see someone with, who, who's a schizophrenia specialist. I, I, I have a colleague I work with all the time who's a schizophrenia specialist. And, um, you know, when, 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 she sees people when they see people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia who actually have OCD, you know, they're not OCD specialists, but they know, hey, I know schizophrenia. This isn't schizophrenia. So sometimes seeing, you know, a specialist rather than like a general psychiatrist can be really helpful with these um, with these diagnostic dilemmas. Yeah, really good point. Um, it's it's something I've heard on the podcast quite a few times over the years, where people uh, either diagnose with say schizophrenia or bipolar, and then later on they find out actually it was neither of those; it was OCD. Uh, and and one lady in particular went to, I can't remember the it wasn't bipolar, but let's say it was. She went to a bipolar specialist, and and they were like, "This isn't that. This is OCD." So as you said, to use your example, it was that other specialty that ruled it out and said, no, it's probably this. Go mm -hmm. see an OCD specialist. If, if there's one other thing I can add that I guess mm -hmm. I didn't talk about, it's probably important to talk about, is there, there is a term schizoobsessive disorder mm -hmm. that we use to, to talk about people with OCD and schizophrenia. But it's important to note that um, people with, who are schizoobsessive, they have to have schizophrenia first. So in other words, there's no such disorder as OCD with psychosis. Mm. That doesn't exist. The, that terminology doesn't exist anywhere. In order to have the schizophrenia plus OCD, the schizoobsessive, um, you first have to meet the criteria for schizophrenia. And in order to meet the criteria for schizophrenia, you have to put aside everything that's OCD and everything that's questionable. 
you know, as I said, people with, with OCD and schizophrenia will have certain symptoms that can be like both. You have to put even those symptoms aside. And only then you look at what's left. If the person meets criteria for schizophrenia, then you can bring back everything else and find out if they have OCD or not. Mm -hmm. But if the person doesn't meet criteria for schizophrenia, there's no such thing as schizo-obsessive then in that patient. So in other words, schizophrenia plus OCD or schizo-obsessive, it's the same thing. It's a subtype of schizophrenia. It's not a subtype of OCD. So again, no such thing as OCD with psychosis. It's a diagnosis that doesn't exist. You can have schizophrenia with OCD. There's no such thing as OCD with psychosis. Okay. That changes how I word this episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. I'll have to do some editing. Um, no, that, that's useful. Okay. So schizophrenia with OCD, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and why is that? I guess I'm a bit confused by that um because in my mind they're two separate disorders so in theory you could have them comorbidly but here we're saying yeah my yeah i'll let you i think you know what i'm getting at yeah i i know what you're getting at. yeah yes you absolutely can have them comorbidly i i think this isn't saying that but okay. um what i think what we're saying is that it's so easy to confuse um some of these ocd symptoms with certain schizophrenia symptoms that in order to be called uh, um, the schizo obsessive category, that you need to make you need to meet the criteria for schizophrenia first. So that is that 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 is kind of the the challenging that that's the challenging thing to meet. That 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 is um, I mean you ha you need to have a lot of things going on to meet the the criteria for schizophrenia. It's kind of a challenging to do that. Once you meet that, you can bring in the OCD. But once someone is once I, I will also say it's probably part of the fact that when you have schizophrenia, you can develop obsessive compulsive symptoms as part of the schizophrenia. When you have OCD, you do not develop schizophrenia like symptoms as part of OCD. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So that's why if you're going to be if you're going to have both, you have to have schizophrenia first. Oh, OK, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um yeah and obviously i think we discussed off air uh a big worry for some people with ocd or a theme of ocd is the fear of going crazy or the fear of um uh, getting schizophrenia or um yeah but that's obviously different to what we've been talking about but i'll link in the show notes to that yeah i mean that, that is that's a very common ocd symptom that, that i see a lot of people it, it's a health anxiety symptom and some people with ocd with health anxiety are worried about physical health some worry about their mental health mm -hmm. um and again it's all equally treatable yeah brilliant you know and i can sit here and say of course i can sit here and say till i'm blue in the face to someone with ocd you know you don't develop schizophrenia because you have ocd that's not how it works but you know that mm -hmm. such reassurances don't work and the patient only gets worse afterwards. So, you know, again, I, I think these statements are fine for a podcast, but they're, they're not what I do in treatment, of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, okay. So slight change. Um, if you could pick up the phone and call the 20 year old Bob, what would you tell him? Boy, if I could pick up the phone and call 20 year old me, I'm just going to say, Hey, it's all going to work out. Hmm. You know, I'm, um, it, it's kind of funny. I, I, I'm pretty happy here. Um, I, I certainly have um, um, a good family and I'm happy with my family. And, and, and that's wonderful. And that's nice, you know, to know. But, um, you know, I, I'll tell you, education is tough. Medical school is tough. And I have a conversation going on with 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 a friend kind of right now where we're talking about these these uh, uh, issues. She's a, a lawyer. And um, we're just talking about how tough the education uh, uh, process is. But I would tell 20 year old Bob, hey, it's going to work out. You're going to have a great career. You're going to be happy with what you do. Quite frankly, Stu, I can't imagine. I don't know what I would do if I wasn't a psychiatrist, because to me, it's it's the best profession in the world. Quite frankly, OCD um, uh, as a specialty is is the best specialty in psychiatry. Um, I'm very happy with what I do. Um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do anything else. I, I don't know what I would want to do. I wouldn't be happy doing anything else. Um, I, I really love the way things have turned out. So the only thing I have for message for 20-year-old Bob is chill out. It all works out. 
Yeah, nice one. Yeah. Um, and then, okay, so you've got a billboard in Pittsburgh. What do you want written on that billboard? Wow, I've got a billboard on Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh. What do I ri- want written on it? Um, well, I, 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 could, I could laugh and say go Browns. Um, the, 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 so, you know, the, the Cleveland Browns are, 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 are a, a football team, American football team, and um, I, I'm a fan of them. And they're also the big rivals of the local uh, uh, Pittsburgh football team. So um, it would be funny to have uh, um, a billboard that, that says that. But, but I think on, on a more serious basis, if, if I wanted um, a billboard, I would probably just put um, – uh, information about OCD and, and the International OCD Foundation on there, quite frankly. Um, you know, what I do is I want to educate people uh, about OCD. I want to educate mental health professionals, and I want to help people with OCD get the, the help and the resources they need. And I, if I could put a billboard, honestly, I, I would put information for the um, International OCD Foundation and tell people if you have OCD, you can get help, you can get better. Nice. Yeah. Good billboard. Um, one actually topic I, I didn't uh, ask you about, but I thought maybe it's worth briefly covering is medication. So is there anything you want to say um, either on medication for, for schizophrenia or medication for the, the two of them combined or? Yeah. Um, so th- that is another fascinating topic that, that I think as a profession, we're still learning about. But we know that some of the medication that's used to treat schizophrenia can actually induce OCD. Hmm. Or at least can um, induce OC symptoms and certainly can make if the person already has comorbid schizophrenia and OCD, it can make the OCD symptoms worse. So sometimes by treating schizophrenia, you can make OCD worse. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fascinating how how that happens. Um, and there may be some genetic there may be some genetic reasons at play. It may have to do with certain specific medications have a greater risk than others. Um, there are different ways that you can approach that, but I think there is a lot of suggestion out there that one of the other schizophrenia medications can help mitigate that. So, for example, a medication called clozapine seems to um, um, have a particularly high risk of inducing OCD symptoms in schizophrenia patients. Rather than using an OCD medication, um, sometimes you can mitigate those um, OC symptoms with another, if you add on a second schizophrenia medication. Um, there's a second specific medication called aripiprazole sometimes that you can add on on top of it to reduce the OCD symptoms. So sometimes you don't need to use OCD medications to treat OCD in people with schizophrenia. Um, other than that, um, other than that little thing, I, t- I tell you what, for the most part, um, the treatment of OCD symptoms um, medication wise is going to be pretty much the same for uh, OCD as, as it is in OCD plus schizophrenia. Again, just the concern is with the schizophrenia medications, you want to try and use the medications that are least likely to induce obsessive compulsive symptoms thank you yeah useful uh cool so thank you so much for your time and your your wisdom i appreciate it yeah sure um thanks for having me i i, I really enjoyed uh, this time to get to talk any any time i get to talk about ocd is is enjoyable it's a good time brilliant thanks bob Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.